God. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to start sharing uh, in sequence this week. I'm going to talk about the authority that God has given us as believers. And let me just say that this is an area that I think there's a lot of confusion in. Many of you may not relate to that title, and you may think, oh man, what does this have to do with me? There's certain things that are God's responsibility, and there's certain things that are our responsibility, that He gave us authority over this. And God won't ever violate those lines. Like, for instance, in James chapter 4, when it says, submit, verse 7, "...submit yourselves therefore unto God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you." You know, those aren't just words that God put in here to take up space. It says in Psalms chapter 89, verse 34, that my covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that has gone forth out of my lips. When God says something, it's a covenant. It's binding. He never changes. And so when God says, you resist the devil and he will flee from you, then if you don't resist, the word resist means to actively fight against. If you don't resist... God's not going to step in and get the devil off your back for you. You have to resist the devil. You have to take your authority. And brothers and sisters, most of us are missing it in this area. This is my experience dealing with people. That people come and ask for prayer and they're asking God to do something that He told you to do. For instance... The scripture says in Matthew chapter 10, Luke chapter 9, He gave us a command to go heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. And yet the average person, when they pray, they don't say, in the name of Jesus, I release the power of God. I command you to be healed. That's not. If you pray that way, you'll get kicked out of church. You know how people pray, Oh God, we can do nothing. We are nothing. Without you, we are nothing. All of that's true, but the thing that's wrong with that is that you aren't without Him. It is true that if you could be without Him, you're nothing. But you aren't without Him. He said He'd never leave you nor forsake you. And for you to stand here and profess your powerlessness and say, God, it's cancer. We can't do anything. You've just killed yourself. You're dying because, well, I, I can't do anything about cancer. Well, then what are you? Only a man or a woman? Are you only a physical human being or are you God-possessed? Do you have God's power living on the inside of you? Any person who approaches their problem and says, Oh, but God, the doctor says it's incurable. Would you please help me? You've already lost. You aren't taking any authority. You aren't taking any ownership of the power of God. You're approaching God as if you are a nobody. Well, I am a nobody. Well, if you aren't born again, that's pretty accurate. But if you are born again, you aren't a nobody. You now have the power of God living on the inside of you and you need to recognize He gave you power. He said, you heal the sick. For you to say, oh God, stretch forth your hand and heal this person is wrong. God won't move. You can't get God's healing power by calling God to come and heal a person. Thank you for that thunderous silence. Some of you are thinking, well, I've never heard this, obviously. But this is how people are praying. Oh God, we're asking you to come heal. You've lost. The moment you ask God to come heal. Somebody's saying, so who are you making yourself to be? In myself, I'm nothing. But see, because of the authority that God gave me, He said, you... Heal the sick. It's up to you whether the sick gets healed, not up to God. I know some of you are kind of shocked, like, uh, but this is true. It is, this is meant to help you. You know what? Have you found Acts 1 yet? Just flip over to Acts chapter 3. Let me start with this. This is a good example of what I'm talking about. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John were going into the temple and um, it says in chapter 3 verse 1, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, 
was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alm, and Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. Man. Most people, oh, you shouldn't point anybody to you. You ought to point them all to Jesus. He says, look on us. You know, you could misunderstand what I'm saying here. I am not trying to present us as being superior to God or anything. But, you know, this friend of mine, he was over in Nigeria holding a meeting. And, and the very first night of the meeting, people started getting healed. Miracles started happening. Blind eyes were open and things like this. And so the next day as he was walking in town through the marketplace, people recognized him from the meeting the night before. And people started running up and touching him, trying to touch him. And you know, his first reaction was, it's not me, it's not me, it's Jesus, don't look to me. And before he could get that out, the Lord stopped him and said, Dave. And he said, what? He says, what would you have thought if that little donkey that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and they started throwing their garments on the ground and putting palm branches and going, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. What would you have thought if the donkey would have said, oh, it's not me, it's not me. <laughs> Nobody was praising the donkey. They were praising the one that was riding the donkey, amen. And the Lord told him, he says, Dave, it's not you thereafter. They see me in you. He says, let them touch you. And he just started walking like this and letting people touch him and people started getting healed. I am not saying that we in ourselves are something special, but I am not in myself. I am now in Christ. Christ is in me and you've got to have a God consciousness and you've got to, when people need healing and they say, man, I came to you because I believe you can get the healing power of God to me. You ought to say, bingo. Amen. Amen. You got it. This is the place. Amen. He said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they reached out and grabbed him by the hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength and God healed him. And he said, such as I have, give I unto thee. Did you notice, if you would study this, he never did pray and ask God to heal this person. He never did say, oh God, we come before you so humbly today and we know that there's nothing good in us and that we are powerless and that, oh God, this is impossible. And spend time confessing his unbelief and just relating to, oh, we're just worms and we can do nothing. You know... You pray like that, you get the results that most of us are getting. He didn't, he didn't pray and ask God and talk about how powerless and weak we were. He said, such as I have, give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. You know what that is? That's authority. He understood that God had put healing power on the inside of him. And if you get healed, it isn't a matter of whether or not God wants you well. That has nothing to do with it. God wants every one of you well. God has already healed every single person. God has already set every person free. It's not up to God whether you get healed or whether you get delivered. It's up to you whether you can receive and believe that He's given you this and release that power by your faith. Man, now that's radically, radically different than where the vast majority of the body of Christ is. You know, the other approach that most people are taking is a chicken way out. It's a cop-out. Anybody can pray, Oh God, we know that you are almighty. That you can do all things. That you can, but you haven't done anything. But you could do anything. Oh God, we know that everything is limitless. And if it be your will, pretty please, heal us. Anybody can pray a prayer like that. That takes no faith. There's no, there's no faith involved in that. But to stand up and say, Father, thank you that according to the word, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, we were healed by your stripes. It's already been done. 
You gave me power over all the works of the devil. In Matthew chapter 10, let's just read this verse in Matthew chapter 10. It's also in Luke chapter 9. Same thing recorded in two different gospels. But in Matthew chapter um, 10, I believe it's verse 1. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them. Notice this. He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. He gave them power. And then you go on down here and read. And he said, like in verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. He didn't say Pray for me and ask me to heal the sick. He said, you take this power and you heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. And this is not what the church is doing. The church isn't healing the sick. They're saying, oh God, we are nothing and can do nothing. We are nobody, but you are everything. We ask you to heal. That's not what he told us to do. And that's the reason that we're seeing very little results because people do not understand the authority that God has given us. It's not my power. It's God's power. But it's not outside of me. It's in me. I have it. God has given me His supernatural power and it's not up to me to just profess and confess how weak and how feeble I am without Him. It's up to me to start recognizing who I am in Him and what He's done and take that authority and speak to my mountain and command whatever the problem is to get out of the way. And brothers and sisters, the vast majority of people I know that this is not your nod to God crowd. You're a Thursday night group braving the traffic in Atlanta. You're fanatics. Or you were drugged here by a fanatic. And yet I can guarantee you the vast majority of people in here are more in the passive mode of, Oh God, would you please stretch forth your hand and touch this person? God, would you? And you're, you're we're beggars. We don't understand that God's already done it. God's already generated the power. He placed on the inside of every person who's born again and spirit-filled right here. These are the verses I was going to start with in Acts chapter 1, but I'll just refer to them now. He says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. God gave us power to be a witness. And did you know what? God won't step in and do what He called us to do. In the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, you find where an angel appeared unto Cornelius. And Cornelius was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. He was a centurion are uh, part of the band. Anyway, he was a Gentile and he uh, was praying, but he, he loved God. He was an honorable man and the Lord sent an angel to him and the angel appeared to him and said, send men to Joppa and inquire for Simon uh, Peter. He's in the house of Simon the Tanner and he will come and tell you words whereby you must be saved. Did you know it would have been more economical, more efficient to have the angel tell Cornelius how to get saved? Why didn't the angel just... Don't you think that an angel understood what it took to get saved? But he couldn't do it because God didn't give authority to angels to preach the gospel. We are the ones that were said, you go preach the gospel. And God has chosen through the foolishness of preaching for people to be saved. How can they believe unless they hear? How can they hear unless they have a preacher? How can they preach unless they be sent? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. God gave us authority and if you don't preach the gospel, people won't get saved. An angel isn't going to appear to them and get saved. They get born again by the incorruptible seed, the Word of God that lives and abides forever. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. And you know, here's another area. I'm not going to major on this this week, but this is another application of what I'm talking about, is that we have people today that are just bombarding heaven and praying and asking God to save their loved ones. And they're praying and praying and praying and praying and praying for people to be saved. People don't get saved through prayer. Prayer is not how people get saved. They get born again by the incorruptible seed, the Word of God. 
Did you know the word seed there is spora? It's talking about like a seed that you put in the ground and it comes from the word sperma, which is talking about a seed that a man sows in a woman, just in the same way that a plant can't grow without a seed being planted or a person can't come into being without a seed being planted. People can't be born again unless they hear the word. It's the word that causes them to be born again. Now, if the word has been sown, you can pray and increase the effectiveness like water or fertilizer would help a seed. But you water barren ground and you're going to get nothing. You pray for people to be saved and yet nobody goes and preaches the gospel to them. That prayer will never be answered because people have the authority to preach the gospel and God has chosen through the foolishness of preaching for people to get saved. They won't get saved any other way. Even this angel appeared unto Cornelius, but he had to send for a physical person. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, this is a major area of misunderstanding in the body of Christ. We're asking God to do what He told us to do. We're asking God to send revival. God, God's not the one that's holding revival back. Some people think that God's up there with His arms folded saying, until you repent, until you get another million people to agree, I'm not moving because you're such a reprobate bunch. Until you repent more, until... That's not it. God's like this. He's got His arms open. The Scripture says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, it says, um, what does that say? <laughs> Here you go. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the next verse says, For this promise is unto you and unto your seed and unto them that are afar off, talking about us, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. God gave this promise. He poured out the Holy Spirit and He's never taken it back. And yet the church today is basically thinking that God withdrew, with, recalled, the Holy Spirit because we aren't seeking Him and He's up there and He's not going to release the Holy Spirit until enough people beg Him and plead and humble themselves. Somebody says, well now 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. It's an Old Testament scripture that did not have Jesus already here on this earth. It's just like the Old Testament scripture that says, Rend the heavens and come down, O God. I've heard people pray that prayer. Rend the heavens and come down. That's an insult to Jesus to pray that. Somebody said, well, that's in the Bible. It's before Jesus came. Now Jesus came. God rent the heavens. He came down. For you to pray, O God, come down, is denying the fact that Jesus came. Jesus came. Now He's poured out the Holy Spirit. And for you to pray and ask God, Oh God, we're asking you to pour out your Spirit. We repent and humbly ask you to... God's already poured out His Spirit. You know where it is? It's inside of you. And the reason that we aren't having more miracles and more revival is because everybody's in their prayer closet asking God to touch these people instead of you taking the power of the Holy Ghost and going out there and releasing it and speaking these things. You need to get out of your prayer closet. <laughs> Preachers can't say things like this, can they? I know some of you are just shocked. We have just barely got started. <laughs> Hold on, man, I've got some things this week that'll uh, rattle your cage. But I'm just saying that, see, we are asking God to do what He told us to do. He says these signs will follow them that believe. We're in our prayer closet saying, Oh God, pour out signs and wonders. The only, only place they could work is in our closet. We aren't out there ministering to anybody. We're afraid to say anything because somebody's going to say that's politically incorrect. Somebody's going to criticize us and call us a Christian. And so rather than us get out there and suffer any rebuke, we're in our prayer closet asking God to do what He told you to do. He said, you go and these signs will follow you. You know the reason you haven't seen very many things follow you is because you haven't gone anywhere. <laughs> if you go out, you know when somebody at work is talking about this terrible economy, and talk, you know every place you go, people are talking about it. Stand up and tell them that my God is supplying all of my needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Tell them that I'm not missing out. 
Tell them that, man, you're doing well. When everybody's talking about it, it's flu season. Say, hey, there is no season that the Word of God doesn't work. You know what? I'm healed by His stripes 24 hours a day. If you started speaking the Word and going somewhere with it, you know what? Miracles would start following you. You'd start seeing things happen. But instead, we wouldn't dare say something. Somebody might look at us wrong. And so we just stay in our prayer closet and we're bombarding God for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Give me a break. We've had millions of people doing that for the last 20 or 30 years and we hadn't seen it yet. If that would work, it would have worked. It's not going to work. That's not the way that miracles happen. You go out and raise somebody from the dead and you'll have all the revival you can handle. I've seen three people raised from the dead and I guarantee you it causes no small stir. Well, I can't do that. See, you don't understand the authority. I just read these verses to you. He says, I give you power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. And then in verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. It's just as much a command to raise the dead as it is to um, preach the gospel, it says right here um, in verse 7. It says, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is hand, at hand. We usually stop with verse 7, but in the same breath that he said, preach the gospel, he says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. You have just as much authority to heal the sick and to cleanse the lepers and to raise the dead as you do to preach the gospel. But we don't realize it. We've been taught by religion that we are nothing and we can do nothing. And if you are going to somehow or another separate yourself from God, that would be true. But I am not separated from God. He will never leave me nor forsake me. And I am somebody in the Lord. And I do have the power of God. And I can heal the sick and, and raise the dead and open blind eyes. And some of you are thinking, I would never say that. Well, it won't work for you. And if you just continue to ask God to please move, you're going to die. And God loves you. I'm not mad at you and God's not mad at you. You don't have to understand what I'm talking about to go to heaven. Matter of fact, you can get there quicker if you don't understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> because you aren't going to have any power working in you because you just are sitting there emphasizing who you aren't and what your flesh is like and how you are a nobody without God instead of recognizing that you've been born again and changed. That's right. Amen or oh me. Amen. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, we don't know what we, who we are. We don't know what we have. We're going around as beggars pleading with God. You know, if... Praise God for His mercy. Praise God for the mercy of God. If I was God, after going to all of this expense, sending my Son, writing this Word, sending the Holy Spirit and all of these promises that say, by His stripes you were healed, it's already done, you go heal the sick, and then people come up and go to saying, Oh God, we can do nothing. Would you please heal this person? If I was God, I'd turn us all into a pile of ashes. <laughs> I mean, a spirit of slap had come all over me. It's actually love. When you pray and are pleading and crying and screaming and begging with everything you've got and you hear nothing, that's love. If He was to answer us according to our foolish prayers, we'd be in big time trouble. Big time trouble. I really believe that sometimes the Lord, if He could be confused, would be confused. <laughs> like I know I told Him. It's in here someplace. <laughs> I know I told Him. I gave them power. You go heal the sick. Didn't I tell them that? <laughs> Isn't that in there? Somebody go find where this is. Amen. <laughs> Boy, that would be discouraging. That would be really discouraging. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, there's not very many people who have taken their position in Christ and are taking their authority. We're intimidated. We're sin conscious. We're constantly feeling that we are unable to flow in the power of the Holy Ghost. Somebody might think, well, maybe a preacher or something can do that. 
but you could never do it. See, again, you don't understand the grace of God. It's not according to anybody's goodness or holiness. If you are the sorriest saint in this room, you have greater power than death, sickness, disease, poverty. You have rights and privileges. And it's not right. You don't have to sit there and let any failure on your part disqualify you. That's the reason you pray in the name of Jesus. You get it on what He did, not based on what you've done. And you know, I've struggled some to understand how, how we could be so dull. And you know, I don't mean this in a bad way, but I'm just trying to get my point across. But I can guarantee you, I'll preach my heart out tonight. I'll, I'll say everything I, I can think of to make this point. And I can guarantee you, without exception, after this service is over, somebody will come up, Oh, I'm just dying. I can't do anything. Would you please pray for me? Just like I haven't said a word. <laughs> it happens every time. And it's frustrating. And I've wondered about God. You, can, you could draw people a picture. You could yell at them. You, can, you can grab them by the shoulders and shake them and people just do not get it. And I've wondered about what's going on. And you know, there's, there's two things that I can think of. One of them is traditions and doctrines of man. Matthew 7, 13 makes the Word of God of none effect. Most people do not let the Word of God affect what they believe very much. They don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. They believe this because this is the way it's been forever. And this is the way it's done in church. And this is the way that my grandma did it. And it's just the way it's done. That's traditions and doctrines of man. And it just kills the power of the Word. And then a second thing over in, uh, I think it's 2 Thessalonians, it says because they didn't believe the truth when they had it. In the end times, God is going to send a strong delusion so that people will just be damned. In other words, there's going to come a time where His Spirit will quit dealing with people because the end times are ramping up, the Antichrist is coming, and He's just literally going to take away the revelation and the conviction of His Holy Spirit so that they wanted to do it their way. All right, you're on your own. And it's one of those two things or possibly a combination of the two. It's either traditions and doctrines of man or we are living so much in the end times that people are blinded to the truth because this is just so obvious. You know, I've already used about a dozen or two dozen scriptures that are just so contrary to our religious culture today. And yet again, most people don't let this influence them very much. I know that this is totally different than anything I've ever heard, but you know what? I believe this the rest of my life. I had one woman tell me, I says, I was born a Methodist and I'm going to die a Methodist. I said, lady, you have. You are dead. I'm not against Methodist. I'm not against any group. I'm just saying that, you know what? The Word of God ought to be absolute in our life. Romans chapter 3 verse 4 says, Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. If this is what the Word says, then I don't care if grandma, grandpa, anybody has done it a different way. What does the Word say? The Word says, You shall receive power. You now have power over all the force of the enemy. You heal the sick. You cleanse the lepers. You raise the dead. You speak to your mountain. It'll obey you. You resist the devil. He will flee from you, not flee from God. He'll flee from you. It's God's power, but it's on the inside of you. He will flee from you. If you don't stand up and take your authority, you're going to lose the battle. And brothers and sisters, this is where most people are missing it. They believe God can do anything. He has done nothing. But maybe if I pray and hold my mouth just right, and if I'll fast, or if I'll study the Word, or if I'll do this, then He will respond to me. I'm telling you that Christianity is not what we can get God to do. It's what Jesus has already done. It's a finished work. It's accomplished. And all you got to do is find out what He's done, believe it, and then reach out and take it. You know, when I was a kid, I was just eight years old. We had a vacation Bible school in our Baptist church. And there was about 600 people in the 
um, 600 kids in this vacation Bible school. And normally, my family had our own pew right down here on the front row. I mean, we were like skunks. We came to church and sat in our own pew. And so normally I had to stay right down here on the front row, but because we were in these groups, they marched us in according to the uh, group that we were in, and they had me on the very back row of this church. And so this guy got out, and he lifted up this $1 bill. Nowadays, kids probably wouldn't go for a $1 bill, but back, uh, that would have been, man, that's a long time ago, do you know? <laughs> Man, that's 52 years ago. 52 years ago, a dollar is worth something. And anyway, he held up this dollar bill and he said, I'll give this dollar bill to the first kid that comes up here and takes it. And instantly there was 20 or 30 kids just around him and they were all jumping and saying, I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll take it. And he just kept his arm up like this and ignored all of them. And he said, I'll give this dollar bill to the first kid that comes up here and takes it. And some more kids came up there and everybody was wondering, what's going on? Every one of them wants it. And he just kept his arm up and finally it hit my lightning fast mind what this guy was saying. And I got out, ran down the aisle, jumped up on the platform and this guy had his arm up in the air and I grabbed his arm and climbed up his side and I reached up there and grabbed that dollar bill. <laughs> and he said, all of you wanted it, but only one of you took it. And then he used that to illustrate salvation. He said, Jesus has provided salvation, but you have to take it. You can't ask for it. You know that the scripture does not teach you to ask God to save you. We use that and say, ask Jesus to come into your heart. That's not what the Bible says. 16th chapter of the book of Acts, I believe it's verse 31 or 32. The Philippian jailer said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul didn't say, well, ask Jesus to forgive your sins and come into your heart. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. You don't have to ask Jesus. Jesus has already died for your sins. He's already paid for them. You don't need to ask. Now, it's not, it's not completely wrong if by asking, it's just a polite way of reaching out and taking what's already yours. But technically, the scripture doesn't say ask Jesus into your heart. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. Whosoever will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved, Romans 10, 9. It doesn't tell you to ask. You can't just, oh God, please save me. Oh God, would you please intervene? No, you have to find out that Jesus has already died. It's already provided. Now, are you going to reach out there and take salvation? Are you going to use some faith and believe and take your authority and receive what Jesus has provided for you? Or are you going to beg and ask Him to do something that He's already promised He's done? And see, it's the same thing with healing. It's the same thing with prosperity. Brothers and sisters, it's done. I've got a teaching out there entitled, You've Already Got It, So Quit Trying to Get It. And it's the same point that I'm making right here. God's already done it. And yet the vast majority of us are asking God to do something because we feel totally powerless. Your feeling of powerlessness is a revelation of your unbelief, either ignorance or unbelief. I don't mean that to be critical. I'm just trying to get my point across. I'm saying it's either ignorant or unbelief. When you sit there and, oh God, I'm powerless. I had two or three people tonight that... Would you please help me? I'm just power. I can't overcome this. You're already in unbelief. You're defeated the moment you believe that because you've separated yourself from God. You're looking at yourself as just a mere human being. You aren't seeing yourself in Christ. You aren't taking a stand of faith. You don't have any power and authority. You're missing your authority in Christ. We have authority. And until we rise up and take the position that God has given us, you can beg and plead and it'll never get you results. And that is precisely the reason that the vast majority of people believe God can do things, but they don't see that power manifest because they aren't taking their authority. They're coming as a beggar pleading with God to do what He already says He's done. Every one of you in here have heard this scripture, 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins and his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. 
We've all heard that. And yet I can guarantee you, every person in here, oh God, heal me. You were healed. It's already been done. If you were, then why are you asking to be healed? Well, because I don't, the doctor says I'm dying because I have this pain. That's in the natural, but in the spiritual realm, you have the same power that raised Christ from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. According to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, you have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead living on the inside of you. You don't need to ask God to send His power. You've got it. If you're born again, you have raising from the dead power on the inside of you. The problem isn't that God hasn't given. The problem is that we haven't believed and taken our position and learned how to release the power of God. Amen. I'm preaching better than you're listening. Look over in Ephesians chapter 2. Here's another application of why you need to understand authority. All of this tonight is kind of introduction. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 1, it's, you know, I just quoted Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, about what is the exceeding greatness of His power. It just keeps talking about that and that everything is now under His feet. And in chapter 2, verse 1, and you hath, past tense, already done, hath, all, all over with, he quickened. The word quickened means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein ye in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You know, this is a radical radical scripture that most people don't really think much about and they certainly don't in practice believe this. But the, look at this again in verse 2. Wherein in time past, this is talking about before you got born again, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. This says that there is a spirit at work in unbelievers. This is very offensive today. This is super offensive. Most people, what are you saying? Are you saying that I'm under the... Con are you saying that there's demonic influence in my life? Yep, that's exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you aren't born again, every one of us, before we got born again, had a prince of the power of the air, a spirit that was working in us. Somebody said, oh, are you saying that they're demon possessed? You know, this whole concept of possessed, oppressed, depressed isn't a scriptural concept. If you look the word up in the Greek, it just means demonized. It doesn't matter if you just got the devil nudging you, picking at you, or if he's totally dominating you, you're demonized, amen. We've made that distinction so that we could sit there and, and fulfill our own theologies about whether or not a Christian could be demon-possessed or not. But the Bible just says that a person has a demonic problem. Every one of us, some of you, again, are going to find this offensive because you consider yourself to be just a wonderful person. And when you got born again, Jesus was just the icing on the cake, but you were awesome before then. You're wrong. We were all the children of wrath, even as others. Isn't that right here in this chapter? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Next verse. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You, before you got born again, had a demonic or a probably better to say corrupted nature a fallen human nature that was susceptible to the spirit of this world, demonic spirits. Every person prior to being born again was influenced and controlled by demonic powers. For instance, it doesn't have to be that you're out here a triple rapist and murderer or things like that. You know what? Selfishness is demonic. Pride is demonic. Jealousy is demonic. 
Envy is demonic. You can prove that over in James chapter 3, verse 16. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion. 1 Corinthians 14 says God is not the author of confusion. So confusion means that it's the devil. Where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Envy and strife opens up a door to anything the devil wants to do in your life. If you've ever had envy and strife in your life, you've had demonic powers operating in you. And I know many of us... Now here's another thing that this is going to... Some of you will think, no way, not true. Because it is really offensive to Christians to say that uh, people are humanist. You know, there was the humanist manifesto, and some of you may not be familiar with that terminology, but humanist is just talking about that they don't recognize God, the spiritual realm at all. Everything is just natural. It's all people. There is no spiritual anything. It's all just natural. That's humanist. And Christians hate that and we dislike non-believers who don't recognize God, who think we just evolved from slime and that there is no spirituality, there's no spiritual part of us, everything is physical and organic. But did you know what? A lot of Christians don't recognize it, but we're very humanist. We don't recognize it. We're fighting a spiritual battle. We think that everything is just natural. You know, I mentioned this earlier during, uh, I think it was the offering, but I was talking about depression. Most Christians today have bought into this 100% that your depression is just you got a chemical imbalance, you need a pill or something like that. You're, there's nothing wrong with your emotions. Your emotions follow your thoughts. There's something wrong with your thinking. And somebody says, oh, now they've proven that people who are depressed have this imbalance. What they're doing is seeing the byproduct of the problem. It's not the problem. That's just like I read this article that said, people who smile are happier than people who don't smile. That was a million, multi-million dollar study over five years. I could have saved them a lot of money by just telling them this, but this was some government study People who smile are happier than people that don't smile. So the recommendation was smile more and you'll be happier. How dumb can you get and still breathe? <laughs> Smiling doesn't make you happier, but if you're happier, you smile more. Why couldn't they figure that out? <laughs> it's not the smiling that made you happy. It's the happy that makes you smile. And I agree that, yes, people have chemical imbalances, but it's not the chemical imbalance that make them depressed. It's the fact that they are focused on the wrong things that causes their brain to get out of whack and chemical imbalances. And you can either give it a pill or you can give it the gospel. You can focus their attention on the Word of God. And if people will start thinking on things that are honest and pure and lovely and just and of good report, if you will do what it says in... Uh, Isaiah chapter 26, 3, where it says the Lord will keep him in perfect peace. I thought you already had Isaiah 26, 3. I thought she knew where I was going. But she was close. But it says the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusteth in him. Peace is an emotion and it's related to what your mind is stayed upon. If you are thinking on depressing things, you should be depressed. That's the way God made you. If you think on good things, you will be blessed. It is, people are missing it. See, there are Christians who hate this thing about the humanists. They don't want to be, and yet they are absolutely humanists. They don't understand that we are in a spiritual battle, that Satan is coming against them, and they are looking for a pill to fix something that a pill isn't supposed to fix. They aren't accepting responsibility. We live in a culture that hates accepting responsibility. We want to blame somebody else. It's what this person did to me. It's because you didn't give me this. It's because the government hasn't given me more money. It's be, and if you can't blame anybody else, just blame it on your dysfunctional family. I didn't have a birthday cake when I was three years old, and that justifies me going out and raping and murdering and plundering because I was abused. Just pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up. Quit blaming everybody else. But we don't like to accept responsibility, so we're trying to pass it. You know, Adam did this when God said, what have you done? He says, it's that woman that you gave me. 
He wanted to blame the woman and then God, you started it. I was fine until you gave her to me. It's been happening ever since then. People do not like to accept responsibility. And so rather than admitting that, you know what, there are things going on. We are in a warfare. Satan is fighting against us. And rather than us taking responsibility, well, I can't help it. You don't understand. I had something happen to me 45 years ago and it's causing me to hurt today. Get over it. Grow up. You love this, don't you? Some of you do. Look at this over in Ephesians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul said in verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is another scripture that people don't believe. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. There are some of you that somebody has come out against you, a family member, somebody at work, and you just think, why are they doing this? And you're mad at them. And you don't understand that they are just a pawn that is being used by a spirit that is speaking through them. We aren't fighting flesh and blood. This person who's suing you, this person who hates you, this person who just, you go to work and they just do not like you. You know what? A lot of it is there is a spirit of Antichrist that is in this world and they know that you are a Christian. They know that you're different and they hate you for it. There is a spirit of Antichrist. There's not a spirit of anti-Muslim. There's not a spirit of anti-Buddha. You know why? Because they're all on the same side. But there is a spirit of anti-Christ. And I can guarantee you, when you stand out as a Christian, you are going to have opposition. And many of you are just thinking, why is this happening to me? And it's really a compliment. The, the devil is motivating these people to come against you and try and fight you. The scripture here says we aren't wrestling against flesh and blood. We are fighting demonic powers. And again, I refer back to James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You need to fight, not in the natural. Don't get mad at the person. When you get mad and say things and vent your wrath on a person, you have played into Satan's hand. You have come down to the natural realm. You aren't using your spiritual authority. You're fighting in the flesh. You know, these verses say that you're supposed to take unto you the whole armor of God and it talks about the breastplate of righteousness and a sword of salvation, I mean the sword of the Spirit and the helmet of salvation and have your loins girt about with truth and your feet shod. It's talking about these pieces of armor as if they are, you know, physical, but it's actually talking about spiritual things. In the spiritual realm you're supposed to do this. And you know what? Most Christians, all they've got is a helmet on. They're streaking Christians. In the spirit, you're just as nude as you can be. You don't have the truth. You don't have the word of God. You don't have the gospel of peace. You're a streaking Christian. And every time somebody comes out against you and you get into the flesh and you get to try and to fight and justify yourself or you get hurt, why did they say this about me? You have just dropped all of your clothes. You are naked. You are vulnerable. You don't have on any of this spiritual armor. And this is what most Christians are doing. They aren't fighting things in the spirit. They're fighting in the flesh. They're down here on a human level and thinking that, why is my boss treating me this way? You know, it's just, there's demonic spirits at work. Every person who's not born again has the spirit of this world working in them against those of you who have the spirit of God. You know, I had a man come to, one, come to me one time and he was just griping and complaining and he says, my boss hates me. He treats Christians badly. He knows I'm a Christian and he does all of these things. And he was just railing against this boss and wanted me to pray that he'd get a new job. 
And I said, first of all, you need to repent of the attitude that you've got. I said, that is an ungodly attitude. It's selfish. All you're doing is thinking about yourself. And he says, but it's wrong what he's done. And he told me that he had worked there for like 10 years. And there were people that had been there. He was the first employee. Now they had like 30 employees. Everybody had been promoted. He was the lowest person on the pay scale. Other people have been promoted. He says, it's not fair. And he does this because I'm a Christian. I said, first of all, you need to repent because you are in bitterness. You're fighting this guy in the natural realm. You aren't recognizing that this is a spiritual problem. I had him repent of that. And I said, why don't you pray for your boss? And find out why he's so bitter. And I said, go to blessing him instead of cursing him. I said, you have done nothing but curse this boss and curse this uh, business since you came in and talked to me. I said, you are supposed to bless and curse not. Quit speaking negatively about it. Some of you right now need to be making an application (laughs) of this to your situation. Instead of cursing the place where you work and talking about what jerks they are and criticizing them and sowing discord among the thing, you ought to go to speaking a blessing over the place because that's how God's meeting your need is through that deal. So anyway, this guy repented. He started praying for his boss. And anyway, the Lord showed him some things. And, and uh, so one day, it wasn't very long after that, his boss came walking through and said something to him and just yelled at him. And instead of this guy fighting back and saying something the way he normally did, he didn't say a word. And so the boss yelled at him, walked out, and he walked back in and he says, what's wrong with you? Because he expected him to get into the flesh and to fight him in the natural. And he says, you know, the Lord showed me that I've been bitter. And he says, I'm sorry. I want you to forgive me for the attitude that I've had. And I've started praying for you. And I don't know what's what your problems are, but the Lord has shown me that you're going through a rough time and I've just been praying for you and I want you to forgive me for the attitude that I've had. This guy got mad and said something and walked off. But you know what? Within a few minutes, he was back and he says, you know, I'm going through a divorce. And he says, man, I've had a rough, rough time. And he says, you know, I haven't been treating you right. I haven't done what's right. And anyway, he promoted the guy to be the manager over the entire business, gave him a, doubled his pay and gave him a two-week paid vacation. When he quit dealing with things in the flesh and started praying and operating in the Spirit, things work differently. And brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in love, but most of us are humanistic. We just think that, why is this person cutting me off in traffic? And you don't understand that maybe, you know what, they didn't see you. Maybe they just came from the doctor and the doctor told them their wife is going to die and they were not thinking about driving. They were, you know, maybe something else was happening. Maybe they didn't think you were the most important person on the face of the earth. (laughs) Maybe it wasn't intentional. Maybe it was just a mistake. But we get so centered on ourselves that just we're convinced that this person did this just because they hate me and they don't even know who you are. Just self-centered We're looking at things only in the natural realm, not realizing that there are spiritual forces going on. Look at this in the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus was asking His disciples, Who do men say that I am? And they said, Some say you're Elijah, some say you're a prophet raised from the dead and other things. He says, Who do you say that I am? And in verse 17... Or excuse me, in verse um, 16, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You know what he's saying here? That that revelation that Jesus was the Christ did not come just from Peter. It was inspired The Holy Spirit inspired it. God inspires people. God moves upon people. I just ministered to one of my Bible college students and um, their apprentices and I was praying for them and I don't know all of our apprentices. I don't know all of the students. And anyway, this lady later wrote me a note and she says, I know you didn't know me and you didn't know what was happening, but she says, what you said just turned her life around. And basically what I said is that, you know what, it's not human or natural that you're so loving and kind and compassionate. This is a gift from God. 
you have, that is an anointing that's on your life is to show compassion. And it just changed her life. She just thought that that was her. Now she realized it was God inspiring it. That was God moving through her and it gave her direction, changed her life. Here's an example where God inspired this. God speaks through people. You can be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Many of the things that happen, it's God doing things. And we miss God all of the time because we're just humanistic, thinking, well, I, you know, that person was nice to me. I wonder why they did that. And you don't even recognize it. God inspired it. Jesus is saying, Peter, this isn't you. This is my Father that gave you this revelation. You know, I was talking to my mother recently. She's 96 years old and she's been on her deathbed for three years. And they say that she can't live through the night three or four years ago and she just keeps hanging on. Every time I see her, she says, I'm sorry it's taken me so long to die. And I said, you don't have to apologize. <laughs> but anyway, I was talking to my mother at Christmas time and she was asking me about the ministry and I was telling her about things that are happening and she was just so blessed and she says, you know that's God. And I said, yes, I know it's God. And she says, you aren't smart enough to do this. She says, it's God. <laughs> And I said, you're right, I, I admit it, amen. But anyway, she was saying basically that, you know what, this was God inspired. God has his anointing on you. God is blessing you. And I agree. Amen. It is God that's flowing and God moves through people. Well, this same person, Peter, just moments later, right after this, after Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto you. Just moments later, he started telling them, he says, we're going to go to Jerusalem and they're going to take me and they're going to crucify me, but I'll rise from the dead the third day. And Peter turns around and look at this in verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, that shall not be unto thee. Talking about, I'll never let them take you. They won't crucify you. And Jesus turned around and said unto Peter. He was talking to Peter. He says, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou, savor, there art, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of man. He turned around and he spoke and said, Satan, talking to a person. We aren't wrestling against flesh and blood. People are being inspired by God and being inspired by the devil and most of us are missing this and we're fighting on only a human level. And when we do turn to the Lord, we turn to the Lord without any sense of authority and just beg Him, Oh God, would you please turn this situation around? Not realizing God gave you the power to do this. You can take your authority. You can rebuke. You can bind those spirits. You can make things change. Most Christians today are just wimps. We're so apologetic. We feel so inadequate like, oh, I couldn't say anything at work. What would they think about me? You know what? You ought, to, you ought to have the attitude. They're the ones that are weird. They're the ones that are perverts, not us. They ought to feel strange. You shouldn't feel strange for standing up and saying, hey, God made them Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, amen. They ought to feel weird for being a homosexual, not us. I'm not mad at them. There's grace and forgiveness and mercy, but I'm saying, you know what? That's not the way that God made it. I shouldn't have to be the one that's on the defensive and afraid of what I'm saying. They're the ones that ought to feel strange. You ought to recognize your power and authority and in love. Now, I'm not talking about being religious and beating people up, but in love, sit there and speak the truth and tell people the truth and tell them the word. You know what? When you get bold like that, it calls it. People respect that. People respond positively. Now, there will be rejection. I'm not saying you'll have a 100% response because Jesus had people come out against Him and eventually crucify Him. So, yes, there will be opposition, but you'll find out there's a lot of people that if we would quit being apologetic and fighting in the natural realm and recognizing that this is a spiritual thing and instead of backing down to the devil, just stand your ground. Just tell people the truth. Tell them that this is wrong. Speak up. Take your authority. Recognize that we're in a spiritual warfare. 
Brothers and sisters, this nation is moving in the wrong direction morally. There are terrible things going on in this nation. And you know why that's happening primarily? is because the believers are timid and shy and we will not stand for truth. There are some of you that work in places that your co-workers would be shocked to find out that you're a Christian baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and believing Him. They wouldn't believe it in a million years because you have given no indication of it. I'm not saying that to condemn you, but I'm saying, you know what? You're timid. You're shy. You aren't taking your authority. And one of the reasons you have that attitude is because you don't know what you've got. We think that we are nothing. And we're just waiting on God and asking God to do something, not realizing God put that power on the inside of you. Do something. Do something. Stand up and say something, even if you're wrong. You know, I, I don't always do this properly, and I'm, I'm really posh now compared to what I used to be. <laughs> Some of you think that I'm brutal now. You should have seen me a long time ago, amen. I'm really loving now. You know, when Jamie and I first got started, I kind of hesitate to tell this because many of you are going to be mad at me. And I'm not saying I did this perfectly, but it illustrates the point that when we were just getting started, our son Josh was only one year old and he'll be turning, what, 35 this month. And so this was 34 years ago. We were standing on healing and my mother had just started trying to believe God for healing and she tried and tried to resist a cold and it didn't work and she failed and so she was half believing that this was all fake and it didn't work. And so anyway, she had just come off of this failure. She was just a little bit bitter. She thought I was a little bit out there and she invited us to go on a vacation to the Smoky Mountains. And Jamie and I didn't have any money, and so she offered to pay everything, so we said, fine. Joshua was one year old, and my mother, when we started out, she says, oh, keep him away from me. I've had this cold. He's going to catch my cold. He'll be sick. Now, we don't believe in that. We believe in healing, and our kid wasn't going to get sick. And so I, I just politely said, he's going to be fine. He will not catch your cold. In the name of Jesus, he's healed. It's no problem. My mother just kept speaking negative. She says, we don't have money to do this. And I said, if you don't have the money, turn around. I don't have any money. I said, I, I can't help you. And she says, oh, I've got plenty of money. But she was just negative and <laughs> then she was doing this and she, when he was sitting in front of the air conditioner, oh, he'll catch a cold. And I said, he's not going to catch a cold. And I just, every time she'd say something, I'd counter it and try and speak the opposite. Anyway, that very first night, we stopped in a hotel room and we were all staying in the same room and we had a little crib for Joshua. And we went to bed and about 11 o'clock, Joshua woke up with this croup in his throat that you could have heard in the next room. And so I got up and I prayed in tongues over him and rebuked this and spoke healing and he was fine within about 20 minutes or something. So I'd lay him down, go back to bed. And in 30 minutes, he woke up with this croup again. And I did that like a yo-yo up and down and from about 11 until 2 or 3 in the morning. And finally, one time on my way back to bed, after I'd gotten him back to sleep, the lights were off. My mother was laying in his bed. And she said, admit it, Andy, he's sick. And I got right down in her face and I said, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I bind your confession. I refuse to listen to your unbelief. I said, my son will not be sick. I reject everything you're saying. And he never got up again. He never was sick. And my mother didn't speak to me for two days. We were on vacation just having a wonderful time and she wouldn't talk at all. And when she finally did spoke, speak, she says, I'm sorry you think I'm the devil. And I told her, I said, Mother, you know I don't think you're the devil. But I said, that was the devil speaking through you. That was unbelievable. That's exactly what Jesus did with Peter. And some of you was, oh, I would never do that. That's the reason that you're sick. It's true. 
There's a lot of you that, you know what, if I was to walk into your house and go to saying, you're going to fail, you're going to be sick, cancer's coming upon you, your finances are falling apart, you're going to lose your... And if I just started speaking curses over you, you wouldn't let me do it. But you'd let your mother-in-law do it. Because you don't want to offend her. You've got to make things work. And you would just allow them to speak death. That's why you're having problems. It's true. It's true. I had a guy call me one time. He had been in the hospital in intensive care. And while he was in intensive care, the Lord spoke to him and says, if you'll call Andrew Womack over to your house, he'll tell you why you can't get healed. And this guy had something wrong that he couldn't eat stuff. And so he would just literally be starving and dehydrated and he'd have to go into the hospital and they'd put him in intensive care for a while. And it had happened either two or three times and he was struggling. And so he called and asked me to come over. I went over. As we were walking in, his mother-in-law was walking out and I said hi to her. And we walked in and sat down. He told me this story and he says, so God told me you would have my answer. I said, I don't have a clue. I said, I don't know what's going on. I said, let's pray. And so Jamie and I, with his family, we prayed. And, we, and I mean 10 seconds into the prayer, the Lord said, it's his mother-in-law. And so I just stopped and I said, this was your mother-in-law that was just leaving as I came in. And he said, yeah. And I said, what's the deal? And he said, oh, man. He says, we used to be in the Way International, which was a cult. And he said, we were just so far out there. We did so many dumb things. And she saw us nearly kill ourselves and our children. And she thinks that we're in a cult now, that we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And she comes over here and says, this is foolishness. You're all going to be sick, nothing. And she just, he started telling me what she said. And I said, that's the problem right there. And I said, you wouldn't let me say that. He says, no way. And I said, but you let your mother-in-law say that because you're trying to preserve peace. And I said, that is Satan speaking death into your life. And because you won't counter it, it's having an impact on you. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 17, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, thus saith the Lord. That verse says, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue, this is how the weapons come against you, is by words. Every tongue that rises against you, you shall condemn. This doesn't just automatically work. Every one of you have this promise. And yet I can guarantee you there's some weapons working against you. You know why? Because you haven't condemned them. You haven't judged it. You haven't countered it. There are some of you that drive down the road and listen to the commercials. <laughs> Jamie and I just did this yesterday about some kind of prostate cancer or something. It says, come on, man, be honest. Are you waking up more frequently during the night and start to... And I just said, no, I'm not. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you know what that is? I just condemn those words. But there are some of you that watch these commercials about have you got a headache? Have you got this? Have you got that? And you listen to it. You know what those are? Those are weapons formed against you that are trying to plant seeds. And unless you condemn it, it won't work. You have to judge it. But there are some of you that just let the sewage of the world flow through you and you don't counter it, you don't say anything, and then you wonder, why is it that I've got these problems? Because people have been cursing you and you didn't condemn those weapons. You have to condemn it. You need to do like Jesus. You know what Jesus was doing? He was a human. He was God, but He was in a human body. He didn't look forward to the crucifixion. I don't think... I, he didn't enjoy the physical suffering, but it was even more than that. It was the spiritual part. It was becoming sin. He hated it. He hated it. And he was tempted. He even said, Lord, if there's another way, let me get out of this. He wanted another way of doing this. And when Satan inspired Peter to say, we'll never let you be crucified. We're going to stand on your side. This will never happen. You know what that was? That was a temptation. That was a weapon coming against Jesus, trying to get him to compromise and think maybe there's another way out of this. And Jesus turned around and says, get behind me, Satan. He was talking to that demonic spirit working through him. There's demonic spirits 
that are speaking to you through the media, through books, through magazines, through people that you work with, through family members, and you aren't condemning them. You're allowing them freedom. You're just looking at things in the natural instead of recognizing there's spiritual forces at work. Now, you can do things better than what I've done. There might have been a more tactful way to approach my mother than what I did. But you know what? It worked. It worked. Now, you can be better. You can, you can use more maturity and do it better than what I did, but you've got to operate in this principle that we're talking about and recognize that we're in a spiritual battle. Satan is coming against us, and we are trying to win a spiritual battle with carnal means, not taking our authority. If you understand who you are, Satan can't stand up against you. Satan trembles when people know who they are. You can get to a place when you know who you are, you can walk into a room and demons will start getting uncomfortable. They'll start crying out. They'll, things will start manifesting. That's the way it was with Jesus. That's the way it's been with lots of people. You can stand up. And you know, I want to encourage you tonight that I, I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I have not always done this properly, but I have seen a lot of miracles happen. I've seen a lot of good things happen. And I've stumbled and I've made mistakes and yet God still uses it. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to always know everything. But just start believing that you know what? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Greater is the Spirit of God in me than this Spirit of Antichrist. And I'm not going to let this unbelief at work dominate me. I'll change the atmosphere. I change the atmosphere of places when I get in there. I do. And some of you think, well, boy, you're arrogant. No, I'm just sure of what Jesus has given me. It's not based on me. It's based on Jesus. But I know that I can change things. I was playing basketball one time with a group of guys. Never seen them before. We were just out at a place and they wanted to play, so we started playing basketball. And man, they were using profanity and saying terrible things. And so I just, you know, when something happened, I started going, Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! And these guys just stopped and looked at me and it's like, What are you doing? I said, Hey, I demand equal time. You praise your God, I praise my God. And I didn't say it in anger. I was kind of joking around with them. And you know what those guys started doing? Every time they messed up, they'd go, Hallelujah! <laughs> and they may not have been sincere, but you know what? I changed the atmosphere of that whole thing. Here was unbelievers going, Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus! And we had a great time. <laughs> Amen. You can do it. I remember one time I was waiting to get paid in the army. And I... Uh, was standing in this little, it was really cold, Fort Dix, New Jersey, and we were in a little tiny 10 by 10 thing that we were huddling from the wind. We didn't have uh, field jackets on, and so it was cold, and we were, there was about 40 of us just shoulder to shoulder packed into this place, and we had to wait for about 30 minutes. And while we were there, there was this one guy, David Posey, who just got to blaspheming God and saying terrible, terrible, terrible things about Jesus. And I was sitting there thinking, oh God, help me to make a difference in this situation. And pretty, I mean, just about the time I said that, he stopped and he says, that's no way for a good old Schofield carrying Baptist to talk. And I said, you got a Schofield Bible? And he said, yeah, do you have one? I said, yeah, you ought to read yours sometime. <laughs> and he says, what do you mean? I said, haven't you ever read Matthew chapter 12, about verse 30 something? where it says, Every idle word that men speak, they'll give an account thereof in the day of judgment, for by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. And boy, this guy, he got mad, and he started pushing his way through that crowd. And right about the time he got up to me, I said, One other scripture, Galatians 4.16 says, Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And you know what? That guy just stopped. I mean, he was face to face, and he just stopped and looked at me and turned his back and never said another word. And for 30 minutes, here we were all huddled together and there wasn't one more word said. <laughs> Some of you think, well, that's terrible. Well, stop the situation. I changed the whole climate. There wasn't any more profanity. There was nothing else said. And did you know I got put into that group with those guys? 
I got changed in my class and I was put with them and for the next six weeks, not one word was spoken to me. Well, I'd walk into the barracks and they'd all be cussing and they'd see me and everybody would just get totally quiet. I'd go sit down at the mess hall and they'd all get up and move and I, I'd have a whole table to myself. Nobody would talk to me. Nobody would do anything. And the day before our Christmas leave, they would all go to the pornographic section and look at the stuff. I'd go into the kids section and get out my New Testament and read it. And David Posey came walking around the corner and saw me and he started to turn around and walk away and he says, Womack, you don't think I'm saved, do you? And I said, I don't know if you are or not, but I, you don't act like it. I said, if, if uh, I was a fruit inspector, I'd say that there's no fruit of it. I said, I've been praying for you. And he says, I, I, I sing in gospel quartets. He had sung with the Happy Goodmans on stage and stuff. And he says, he says, ever since you've talked to me, he says, I hadn't been able to sleep at night. He says, man, I've been so convicted. He says, could you please pray with me that I'd get saved? <laughs> and anyway, we had to go back to class. And the next day we left on our Christmas leave. And I said, you know, as soon as we get back from our Christmas leave, I said, I'm going to pray with you. I'll help you. And um, he's the only person in our whole class that didn't go to Vietnam. He got shipped to Germany, and I never saw him. And I didn't know what happened until 25 years later. I was on television. This is before I had my own program. I was a guest on somebody else's. And I was telling that story about me standing there and challenging him over these scriptures. And he was in another room, and he says, I know that voice. <laughs> and he came walking out. Turns out he's an Assembly of God associate pastor in Tennessee someplace and he came up where I was preaching and we got reunited and he told me all that story. But you know what? God used it. I didn't do it perfectly, but God used it. Brothers and sisters, you're the one that is alive. Other people are dead. We ought to be the ones that are bold. You need to get out of this chicken spirit thing and start recognizing that you are the anointed one and that we are in a spiritual battle and take your authority and stand up to the devil. I'm not talking about being mean to people. I'm talking about standing up to the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. Recognize we aren't fighting.